We make decisions every day. Some of these decisions are trivial. Should I get a hamburger or a piece of pizza for lunch? Should I wear my blue shirt or my red shirt? Should I watch TV or surf the internet tonight? Others are highly consequential. Should I try to get a job after I graduate or go on to graduate school? Should I propose marriage to my girlfriend or move on to another relationship? Should I undergo this dangerous but potentially life-saving operation? All of our decisions have some impact on our lives. Even trivial decisions like what to eat, how to dress for work, or whether to exercise or watch TV will have cumulative consequences over our lives. When we talk about decisions, we're talking about choices among alternative courses of action in pursuit of a goal. What that means is that we're in a situation where we want something, and there are different ways that we can go about getting it, and we have to decide which way we'll choose. There are five parts of a decision. First, decisions have goals, things that we're trying to accomplish. Then, there are options, different choices that we can make in pursuit of that goal. Each choice has a potential payoff or benefit, some way that it will help us reach our goal. Each choice also has risks, a chance that something will go wrong and take us further away from our goal. Finally, decisions involve decision rules, ways that we decide which choice is best. Let's illustrate these five parts using an example. This is Roy and he's stressed out about his retirement savings. The issue Roy is facing is that he wants to find a way to manage his retirement savings well so that he has enough to retire on. The first step in this process is we have to figure out what his goal is. If we don't know his goal, we don't know what to strive for or how to tell if we've done well or poorly. In this case, Roy's goal is to accumulate money, probably as much money as possible when he retires in about 20 years. Once we've pinned down what we're looking for, the next step is for us to enumerate our options. Those are alternative courses of action, things that we can do to reach our goal, which is to accumulate money. For simplicity's sake, let's say that Roy can do one of three things. He can invest his savings in the stock market, he can invest it in bonds, or he can keep it in cash. The next step is we have to figure out a way to discern our better from worse choices. And part of it is discerning the payoffs of each choice. Payoffs are the potential benefit of a good outcome. If we make a decision and it turns out as planned, what's our benefit? How much closer will it get us to achieving our goal? Now there's lots of ways to assess payoffs. Some people use intuition or speculation. They talk with friends and get opinions. But in this course, what I'm going to press you to do is to use evidence to make decisions. One way to gauge the potential payoff of each of our choices is to look at how they've done historically. In any decision, the past won't tell us what will happen in the future with total accuracy, but at least it's better than pulling out our predictions from thin air. To figure out the best case scenario for stocks, I took data from the past 100 years of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The best 20 year streak for the Dow Jones was 14.6% per year. That happened between 1980 and 1999. At that rate, if you invested $10,000 in the Dow Jones companies in 1980, you'd have $152,000 in 1999. In just over half of all years since 1901, the stock market earned more than 6% a year. So in general, you have a decent chance, at least more than even, of getting a pretty decent return of 6% on your money. For bonds, I used historical returns on 10-year treasury bonds. For that investment, the best 20-year streak was 11.2% per year. And in 30% of all years, investors earned more than 6% on their money. In general, holding your money in cash has little upside because inflation eats away at its value. The best period ever for holding cash was 1921 to 1940, a period in which the U.S. suffered a lot of deflation. But in 4% of all the years in the past century, 
money has earned more than 6% real return. This means that the upside of holding cash is very low. We know that in investing, like many things in life, there are downsides in addition to upsides. This is what we'll call the risk of a decision, and it's the potential harm of a bad outcome. It's the possibility that we make a decision and it turns out badly and takes us further away from our goals. Again, we can use evidence to figure out the downside or risk of each of our investment options. This table looks at the same three indicators, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, Treasury Returns, and Cash, which I measure by inflation. We see that in this case, bonds have the best downside scenario. The worst 20 year return over the past century for bonds was 1.7% a year. And in about 18% of all years, bonds lost their money. Stocks are a bit riskier. The worst 20 year return ever was lower. 1.2% per year, and in about a third of all years, stocks lost their money. Cash has a very big downside. The worst 20-year uh, streak, cash lost about 6% of its value every year. And in about 84% of all years, cash people who held cash lost wealth. The fifth part of any decision are decision rules. Decision rules are rules or methods for assessing an option's desirability. Roy has a few choices when he's deciding which option is best for him. He could pursue the maximum profit, or he could try to minimize risk. Or he might do something else, like stress investment in ethical companies. In this example, let's say that Roy's going to maximize profit. Remember, his goal was to have as much money as possible. He could have tried to have gotten as much profit or reduced the risk that he would have lost any money. Choosing ethics, while it's a noble goal, would not directly help him reach the goal that was the focus of this particular decision-making exercise, which was to accumulate money. Now we're being a bit simple here. In the real world, often our decisions have multiple goals and we have more complicated rules for choosing our best option. We're going to keep it simple here though. If we look at our two tables, we see that stocks clearly have the highest upside for maximizing profit. They have the best 20 year return on record and the largest number of years or the most frequent number of years in which returns exceed 6%. And there you have it, the five parts of a decision. A decision is a choice we make about how to act or how to think. Decisions are motivated by goals. Those are things that we're trying to get or things that we're trying to accomplish. They also have options. Those are choices about how we can go about getting our goals. Each option that we have, each choice that we face, has potential upsides. Those are ways that we'll get closer to our goal if the choice turns out well. And they have risks. Potential ways that we can be taken further away from our goals if the choice goes badly. Finally, decisions have decision rules. Those are rules or methods that we follow to determine which of our choices is best. For more information, please visit my website, www.josephncohen.org.